Hold on to your butts. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Wesker demands. Now this affects Iris. Um, Iris, where are you? What you feel only matters to you. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Iris, I have a tip for you. Don't take drugs! Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host, Iris, and I'm here with my older brother, Wesley. Today we're talking a movie from 2021. A new release, The Tender Bar. Yeah, but I mean, does it feel like a new movie? It was definitely sepia-toned, right? Like in post? <laughs> or is, is that just what Long Island bars look like? I think it was just reflection off of all of the uh, velour and uh, rust-colored <laughs> right? wardrobe. It's like uh, Steven Soderbergh or stuff, like Mexico is all orange in those movies, <laughs> in a lot of movies. I think Long Island, New York is just kind of sepia-toned. <laughs> Uh, this raises an important question. Is it sepia or sepia? Sepia. I don't know. Honestly, I've never heard the word spoken aloud until now when I venture to guess. Uh, well, you know what? We're going to find out. Dictionary.com with the sepia. Okay. Corrected. These are the kinds of things. That's the kind of thing that like a father figure should teach you. Like, So you don't just stumble through life saying the wrong thing. Oh, do you? you need, like a man. A man to, in your life to teach you how to be a man. I don't know what accent that is. Are you saying that you have trauma? I'm saying we all have trauma. The dad was a fuck up. Everybody in this movie was kind of a fuck up, right? It was just like, who's the least fucked up? And is any father figure better than having no father figure? And secondarily, can these all this group of misanthropes and fuck ups avoid fucking up the kid? <laughs> And there's our explicit content warning for this episode. Like planes, trains, and automobiles. I knocked it out in one scene. Um, we all have trauma, man. I mean, the kid's gonna, <laughs> the kid's gonna be messed up. That's what it is. It's true. And I, and as a parent, I have come to kind of accept that, or at least, like, I'm not gonna be a perfect mom. They're going to hate me for whatever reasons. And I just hope that they'll see that I tried my best. Because honestly, I don't know. And wow, I'm turning this into a therapy session really fast. But I don't know that our parents tried their best. No, I think our parents left us to our own devices, which according to Bill Burr is essential for a kid finding their way and learning to understand and be self-reliant, understand that things aren't always going to go your way, that you can't be cuddled out of your trauma, out of life experiences. And, you know, this was very much a 19, presumably 1970s sort of upbringing, which, while we weren't quite of this era, feels relatively similar, where our family just kind of did their things. And it's not that mom and dad were absent, but in terms of focus, I didn't really have dad sit me down and be like, this is the things you need to do. You never hit a woman, even if she stabs you with scissors, you know? I never got that. It was more social cues that we got from our peers, I think. Yeah, being observationalists and, and having to kind of learn from the hard knocks of the street. Maybe that's take, maybe it's taking a little bit too far. But do you open Kelly's door? Uh, whenever possible. I don't always do it. I don't, I don't have a lot of strengths in that department. I'm not like, well, if she doesn't like me, then someone else is gonna. So you take what you're going to get. I, I don't know where this accent is coming from. I don't know. Like, it's like a brusque. <laughs> Like, like Eastern. I don't know what it is. It's coming from the amalgamation of all the accents that we heard in this movie. I feel like in order for me to be, you know, someone desirable, I guess, as a life partner, I need to try really hard. I think all partners need to try hard. I mean, partnerships take nurturing. And this family, to bring it back around to the tender bar, has their own dynamic support system thing going on and their house and the grandpa is kind of the nucleus of that and even though they might be dysfunctional in other relationships there's a certain amount of understanding and acceptance within the family that I think we also kind of had that I really related to oh yeah you know, his dad is messy. His mom is, is sort of hapless and she has the best of intentions, but it's not like she can guide him through the adolescence. She's kind of relying, hopefully, on Harvard or Yale and hopefully that direction and that focus will get him through. But uh, he ends up with this motley band of family characters and the grandpa, he doesn't see, you know, he shows up for the school thing. 
or whatever. And I was like, okay, why is is Doc Brown going with him to this? Is it just to get more screen time? Because it would have made, I think, much more sense for the character who wanted to be hands-on, Uncle Ben, to be like, I'm going with you and I'm going to smoke cigarettes and they're going to see how honest I am. Well, he did. He did go with him to the, the uh, administrator was like all about psychoanalyzing the kid and like hitting on his mom or whatever. But the, <laughs> um, but the, that's like, that, that also felt very 70s. In, in an inappropriate licorice pizza kind of way. Sure. But why did the grandpa, the, the farting, irascible armchair Christopher Lloyd, go with him to the school thing? It just seemed like, well, we got Christopher Lloyd. Why wouldn't we send him out on another scene? Get him out of the armchair. He didn't get a shotgun in this one, but... Uh... No, not nobody style, no. But also, you got to remember, this story is real life, man. In fact, the grandpa probably took the kid, and so you can't just take liberties with real life and have substitute another character in for the, you know, the doctor <laughs> right. visit or whatever it was. But look, I came at the tender bar as a movie. I didn't know. This is the tick, tick, boom of non-musical period <laughs> memoirs, right? I didn't know. What, I was like, this is real because it's a little bit meandering, you know, but going back to what you said in trying to reinforce who these characters are in terms of their little insular support system, from what I could tell, the family, you know, in, in looking for that support and as messy as they were, kept coming back. Didn't they move in and out like four times? It's like a revolving door of kids coming back home for solace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the house was the same. It was always grandpa's house. And then they all just kind of came and went as they fell on hard times. And I did that. When I went through breakups and stuff, I would just go home and mom and dad would come back from like Vegas or something. And I'm like, I'm here. And mom's like, oh, well, you're going to stay for a while. And, and that ended up being like six years but whatever <laughs> those were some dark days i think that the difference between like the 70s and 80s and now is like conscious parenting yes focus in thinking of imparting their wisdom to their kids jr's dad decided that when it was time for him to be available he could impart some wisdom directly contrary to his actions. What exactly was that wisdom? I don't know, but he thought he was the man. He held held an opinion of himself as the man. And Ben Affleck's character on the other side also felt worthy of dispensing wisdom from behind the bar, the ba. I think mom and dad's difference was positioning us to have every opportunity and every experience without sitting us down, looking us in the face and saying, this is what you should and should not do. Right. We never wanted for uh, social situations, you know, going with people places. I remember always money to do whatever it was we felt we needed or wanted to do within reason. I definitely struggled with things that I wanted them to buy me and things and they almost always came through unless it was absurd and ridiculous, which in hindsight, a lot of it was. Huh. They positioned me to have all the experiences I need to have with, like you said, a kind of otherwise hands-off approach to direct parenting or passing on of advice and knowledge. And I do think that their parenting style was a product of their time and of their background or family of origin or whatever, like everyone's is. And I think that what Tender Bar successfully does is call into question the structure of family. Like, they all might be fuck-ups, to use your word, but their family is rather functional. And I think that has a lot to do with the grandpa being kind of so stable, or at least, you know, a fixture. And with Uncle Charlie, who was also a, a fixture within the household, but Uncle Charlie, who's clearly a smart dude, who you think if he applied himself could be a quote unquote successful dude, whatever that may mean. But Charlie never, I never got an indication from Charlie that he was unhappy with his station in life. I think he was happy with his friends. He knew who he was and his value in a relationship and his place in his family. And he, and he took real pride in his position as an uncle. And I never got from him that he wanted for anything more than what he had. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, he seems like this bar, the tender bar, the Dickens bar. Is, I don't know why it's the tender bar necessarily. I get it in a vague way. It's a little bit of a clunky title. But I think that the bar was largely his identity. That if he wasn't behind the bar with, with the family bar or whatever, he'd still be in that bar with those dudes doing his thing, dispensing barstool wisdom. 
which is something that Yale can't possibly buy. He did feel very secure and confident in dispensing that. And, you know, that support system also in the bar patrons who don't really have a lot of direction in life themselves, who are happy to dispense wisdom. And then if you do a good thing, they further that by saying, back him up on me or, or <laughs> put him on my tab or whatever it was they said. It's just like this... <laughs> This boozy support system of general masculinity, which is indirect, but, but, but you know, it's like the bro hug of, of parental raising tactics. You know, I'm just, <laughs> I'm trying to understand what is Tender Bar's angle? Like, what's its novel approach? Like, it's not this. Oh, the novel approach. Oh, it's not. Oh, man. I don't know. It's not the. I think I know what it is because it's not the plot. It's not these exceptional characters doing exceptional things. It's not even the tone, really, which wasn't. I don't know. It wasn't the tone. The tone didn't really stick out to me like this film had a very specific voice. But I think what the tender bar was going for is look at this very unconventional upbringing and how resilient kids can be and and how much they can take. If you throw a real life at a kid, like they can take it. And I think that that would be very interesting to some people. But to me, I'm like, (laughs) yeah, that, yeah. And so like that was (laughs) kind of my experience. So I don't find it to be like, oh wow, that's such an interesting different approach to childhood. We lived our version of this wonder years to an extent, albeit entirely across the country, a full 4,000 miles away. But I could see people looking at this movie enviously and saying this family support structure is something I didn't have, to your point. But I do think that all of us go through this kind of upbringing where we're totally stupid and we have family trauma. And are we going to repeat this family cycle of idiocy and and stuff? Which it seems like JR was fortunate enough to avoid, except he still did a lot of dumb stuff. Very frustrating to watch his interaction with Sydney pining after her for years and years and would would defy him at every turn and it made me dislike her in a way that i remember this feeling of rejection and this one-sided affinity and hopelessness of unattainable girls uh it was a little bit like summer in 500 days of summer where she wasn't unclear in her intentions Mm -hmm. you know i like you it's fun but i don't want a relationship right kind of thing And he couldn't accept that. But also I feel kind of justified in disliking her because of how poorly she acted knowing she was leading him on. Mm -hmm. That thing about come over to my parents' house and we're going to audibly bone and make them uncomfortable. Why would he stick around to be antagonized at the breakfast table (laughs) after he knew that there was no hope or future? Just so he could kind of act out and throw it back in her parents' face, you know? I don't know. His decision-making was frustrating because he was adrift like almost all of us are in adolescence. He still had hope. He was still holding out hope that he could repair things with Sydney. I mean, she did basically just dump him that morning, which did not Ugh. set him up for success at the breakfast table. And he, he seemed like he was going to put on his best face and make an appearance. And then when things went south, I was happy that he didn't just roll over and take it. I don't know that it was appropriate, but, (laughs) you know, he wasn't just going to, like, sit back and be abused. Right. Until the next time he had lunch with her at that little bistro or whatever, after all that happened, which I think was the last time we saw her, where she again told him, "Eh, I'm seeing somebody, though. And he's yeah. like, oh, man. <laughs> we saw her in the newspaper, but she did kind of abruptly leave the picture. So it was a little confusing because she was made out to be the stakes. And then suddenly she gets married and he, I guess, is forced to move on. And that's just kind of it. As with most memoirs, yeah, the stakes seem to be whatever trauma he was experiencing at that particular time. It seemed a little bit meandering. And it was also edited kind of for comedy. Don't you think? Like the whole yeah. thing with like the stand under the window yeah. and in the, rain. in the rain and stuff. And there were three or four instances where it was obviously edited for comedy, all of which fell flat for me. Sure. It was a little bit too dumb to be sharply comedic. Yeah. And maybe just a little bit too dumb ultimately, or at least foreign enough to me that it didn't feel as thoroughly heartwarming and like the movie that Ben Affleck says we all need right now. 
because Affleck and Clooney are very clear. George Clooney directed this movie and Ben Affleck starred in it. The world is a hard place and this movie is nice and it's about love and family and father figures and that's kind of it. What was the movie The Way Back? Clooney wasn't involved in that, was he? I don't think so, no. Um, but I drew a lot of parallels. Yes. I was like, here is another one of Ben Affleck's sort of roundabout feel-good kind of movies. Also, also alcoholism adjacent. Right. This is what Ben Affleck does, playing the new Ben Affleck and also playing the old Ben Affleck. It's Ben Affleck's thing to dispense bar wisdom and then at the end give a car to a gifted kid <laughs> who, who's trying to escape to the Ivy League. And, 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 a la Goodwill Hunting. And escape the neighborhood, right? Get out of the life that's going to hold him back. <laughs> and in that way, as meandering as this movie was, I was really convinced that I was like, he's not going to take that car and go, go find that girl, right? Please don't go find that girl. <laughs> again, a la Goodwill Hunting. This could easily be Chucky again if Chucky moved to Long Island instead of San Pedro or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And set up a bar, totally. This, <laughs> this is The Way Back Part 2, Volume 2. Ty Sheridan was looking pretty fit, and I thought that uh, this was a nice turn for him from Ready Player One. Check out our review available on or whatever movies.com. <laughs> But I never thought he looked so little as when he confronts his dad at the end. Like, to yeah. me, he felt like a dude who was, like, coming into his own. And then when he stood up to his dad, I was like, wow, he feels like a little kid. <laughs> but the dad, he was all beer gutted by then. He was like a gigantic version of Matt Damon's character in Stillwater. Oh, my gosh. I'm getting very confused with all of these <laughs> Ben Affleck, George Clooney, and Matt Damon references. He had the uh, the starchy flame retardant jeans and the the big work boots and the gut sticking out from the flannel shirt, right? Yeah, yeah, the open flannel shirt. Uh huh. Uh, so the dad was pretty big. He was an imposing guy, even from the establishing shot showing him from behind, where you're like, oh, they're showing the dad from behind. He's obviously a bad guy, right? And he was. As bad as this movie could possibly get, he was the worst guy. And so, yeah, he was imposing and stuff. But Ty Sheridan, he's a kid. I mean, I was shocked to find out that he was 25, that he is 25 years old because of Ready Player One. Ty Sheridan isn't exactly a conventional looking leading man, but I thought he had a certain charm in his courting of Sydney. Now, Sydney, I think, embodies this weird kind of feral, sassy, knowing in charge female archetype that's popular these days. Like, I feel like there's a lot of these kinds of characters. I think she's exactly the kind of lady that all the bar guys would warn him against. There's these ladies and they're smart and they're crazy and they go to school and they got their parents. You don't want to get caught up in that. Don't get caught up in that and don't hit a lady. <laughs> I mean, she was a dynamic, obviously a smart character and had her own weird family drama dy dynamic. It was uncomfortable. It was very uncomfortable. Why were they so intentionally making him uncomfortable? I think because she was defying him, them by bringing home a dude she had no intentions of settling down with or making an effort with. Mm, interesting. So they were actually responding to their daughter's defiance and being kind of and taking it out on him? I think so. I mean, they were home for Christmas because that's what you do. You go home for Christmas. But it doesn't mean that everything is rosy. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean that just because your dad calls you and says, hey, kiddo, we're going to a baseball game. I'll be there. It's not like that he's going to show up. It's not given. But, you know, why does he keep going back? He's seeking out that love and that affection that focus and he can't get it from his dad and he keeps doing it with the girl and you know he's just he's chasing the thing that he wants and seems unattainable and i wonder how much of that in adulthood for all of us how much do we position ourselves to repeat these cycles of desire we always want what we haven't got as sinead o'connor would say <laughs> are we just doomed to repeat our traumas i'm, I'm still stuck on sinead o'connor nothing compares to you uh, that her album was I do not want what I haven't got. Okay, so she's enlightened. So I guess that's that, that's misquoting. She's enlightened, actually. It sounded like a Sinead O'Connor album. <laughs> okay, just want to clarify that. But what was your what was your question or point? That Sydney had issues, but Jr. also had his. I blamed him as much for continually going back and seeking out her affection in the same way that he always sought out his dad's affection. He idealized it and always hoped that there was something else that would fulfill him just over the horizon that he could never quite attain. Which he didn't find. He's going to Manhattan or whatever, but it was kind of just like the arbitrary end to his story. Right. This is how <laughs> this is how uh, writers stories end. It's I learned a whole bunch of stuff and I didn't get real resolution. So I'm going to write about it instead. <laughs> well, at least 
Uh, who's your favorite actor? The guy who makes the mashed potatoes and says it's something. What? Um, mashed potatoes? Close Encounters. Dreyfus. Yes. Who At Ron least... Livingston sounded an awful lot like in <laughs> That's, what I'm, right? That's what I'm saying. So at least Richard Dreyfus had a point because he says... I'll never have friends like that again. Right. I'm paraphrasing, but I'm talking about the end of Stand By Me. And that story, which, you know, does have some exceptional circumstances with some, you know, very compelling characters, also has a bow. And that is the writer's responsibility is to help us understand what their intention is, what they're trying to communicate to us. Stand By Me is a very satisfying coming of age story, especially when you're getting that kind of older version of you perspective, which they played with a little bit here in the tender bar when when Uh, young JR talks to older JR and uses a lot of curse words and stuff. Ham handed. And that was again, was that comedy? You know, was that poignant? Was that what was trying? It was trying. It was trying to do something. But are you saying that did Ty Sheridan do the narration, the Richard Dreyfus narration? No, Ron Livingston did, who we never got to see. Ron Livingston is an actor we know. He's been in a bunch of stuff and Office Space and Band of Brothers and Sex in the City and all this stuff. But we didn't get to see his face. He just sounded absolutely Richard Dreyfus appropriate. I mean, he was channeling Gordy Lachance like 100 percent. And then at the same time, Ron Livingston apparently went to Yale, as did the author of The Tender Bar, whose name escapes me. William Monaghan. Uh huh. And Ron Livingston, who plays the narrator and the older JR, went to Yale as well. They were about seven years apart. So I guess they got him for his Richard Dreyfusness and also his Yale, New England sort of accent. I don't know that Long Island, New York is New England, but I've ne- never having spent much time there, I don't exactly know. <laughs> I don't think so. Even New Haven, where is it? In Connecticut. Got it. Oh, that's right. And she's from, and Sydney's from Connecticut. Anyway, (laughs) I would say that Ben Affleck works very hard to keep us very grounded in this New England environment. Or maybe he doesn't work hard at all. This is just him (laughs) doing this jick. He's just there whenever Ty Sheridan needs advice or needs a drink. Because the first thing he told nine-year-old or eight-year-old JR is you don't put your money in your front pocket. And you got your cigarettes and you get your drink and then you live your life with your drink and your cigarettes, right? Again with the accent. (laughs) <laughs> but then, so you know, when he came back into the bar with his buddies, I, I was like, so all that stuff, all those good intentions are going to go out the window because he's going to get these underage kids loaded. Well, they were 21. But I thought they were all like fake IDs. And he was just kind of like wink, wink, nod, nodding him into the bar. And like, but then he made the announcement and I was like, oh man, they're really 21 because like 15 minutes ago he went off to Yale and it seemed like we jumped through years very quickly. And I, and it was, it was hard for me to keep up. I hear you. I mean, I felt like there was a lack of continuity in the midnight sky in George Clooney's last and looking him up, he directed a bunch of movies. So he's, he's got some experience, but I, I think his movies have to suffer in editing or something because the continuity was strange and didn't flow terribly well for me in this one. Which leads me to my larger impression about this film. This felt more like a streamy movie than it did a Ben Affleck or a George Clooney movie. I, and I don't want to put down Amazon or Netflix or these amazing content providers that are opening up so many opportunities for filmmaker voices and whatnot. But it does feel a little bit like they're in the volume game right now. They're churning out these films and they're greenlining these projects, these passion projects from different filmmakers and our tours, but then kind of putting them through an assembly line-ish type process. This is just what it feels like to me. This is my impression. And I feel like they're churning out movies like The Tender Bar that are okay. They're like, okay. They're good. They're fine. But they're not what I expect of filmmakers like Ben Affleck, who did Argo, or George Clooney, who did Michael Clayton. Really incredible films. Does it, you think the tender bar feels kind of worthy of these filmmakers? No, not at all. It does feel a little bit slight, but I don't think that's the intention of either Ben Affleck or George Clooney. I think they are very dedicated filmmakers, and they have also both played Batman. <laughs> and so they can be perceived as kind of lighter or slight But I think they really want to make impactful, important movies. I also kind of think this is where they are in their lives. Ben Affleck talked about, you know, his struggles with alcohol and 
his messy breakup stuff that he ruined for himself and and he wants to shift his focus to you know emotional movies and in doing so spend more time with his kids and george clooney notorious wild man is now settled down and also is married and has kids and this is their kind of jam. And I think they had the best of intentions and probably uh, Amazon did as well. But maybe, maybe, uh, come at me, bro, George Clooney doesn't quite have the deft hand to pull off a story like this. You know, is it a comedy? Is it a drama? Is it heartwarming or is it heartbreaking? Like, is this a film that should be deceptively complex that would require a skilled hand? Or is it just kind of a simple thing? Well, look, we talked about Stand By Me and how the Ray Brower kid that they're looking for is a MacGuffin, right? He's just the device to get them together and on the road and talking. And as such, once those stakes are gone, then they just sort of drift back to Castle Rock and I'll see you when I see you. And now Vern is working at the lumber yard as a forklift operator. And so in the same way, Jr. goes off to his, oh, spoiler, by the way, for Stand By Me, sorry. <laughs> you really should have seen that one. But Jr. goes off to an uncertain future. And if we had been able to see those angles, if we'd been able to see, oh, this is open-ended and still this is unresolved and this is the kind of person he's going to be, of course, we understand that he's going to be an author and a novelist. But I didn't feel like we had anything left to hold on to when he was set adrift. In a way, it was open-ended, but still had a bow on it. Like I didn't, once the, the credits fade, I didn't think about Jr. at all, except to focus on this review. Whereas Stand By Me, you wonder. They felt like rounded characters. It's not as though Jr. and, and Uncle Ben, what was Uncle Charlie? It's not like they didn't, but I also kind of stopped caring. And maybe it was because this was non-eventful in the scope of our lives. If I could further compare the tender bar to Stand By Me, I think Stand By Me succeeds because of the depth of the friendships and the resolution and the meaning that comes with the resolution. Like to hear that Chris gets murdered in the fast food restaurant or whatever it was after Spoiler. having become a lawyer <laughs> still makes me emotional. And to think that Vern and Teddy kind of hang around Castle Rock. And even though that seems fitting and appropriate, it's kind of like you get it. Like you get that that's just some people's trajectory in life. And all is to say that I think we don't get the depth of the relationships that Ty Sheridan has with his, this blended family that he has. And also, we don't get any resolution. Like, what happens to mom after she goes and gets her job? Right. She got a job. Things are looking up. We don't get any resolution for Bobo and Joey D and Chief and all these, the bar flies. Did you write down the bar patrons' names? <laughs> I'm looking at IMDb. <laughs> Is he credited as Bobo? <laughs> <laughs> Chief? Bobo, Joey D. Oh, now I want to know what my bar nickname is. <laughs> Do you think it's because Stand By Me showed us and didn't tell us? I mean, the narration is fine, but it was kind of bookendy and only here and there from Richard Dreyfus in Stand By Me. Likewise here, but I just didn't feel that level of depth. And I wonder if it's because of our age that I didn't feel this eight-year-old kid's journey and I did feel it more when this stupid kid is chasing this girl, but uh, it seemed like the elements were there. I just didn't feel it. But we do have to note that his college roommate, uh, Wesley, as we all know, Wesley, all the Wesleys in movies speak truth. And uh, his advice was F that chick, which was absolutely correct. <laughs> well, that was that was later, though. First, he's like staring in wonder as Ty's making his move. And then at the bar or at the restaurant later when he's like in a suit and doing God knows what, that's when he's like, forget her. Yeah, but he was also like, guys, we're at Yale. We're supposed to feel it. It's amazing. Accomplishment of our life's dream. Let's get fucked up. And we're all come from a poor background or whatever. Maybe this movie just told us and didn't show us. Yeah, maybe. Maybe it was a little bit too familiar to be novel. Maybe it's our age, and maybe it's a lot harder than we think to make real meaning out of the stuff of life, like the sim the simple kind of coming-of-age journey, because I felt like there was really deep meaning in the coming-of-age story that's told in the body. and A.K.A. Stand By Me. But not so much here. Like, I didn't feel that same wonder and heartbreak and questioning and all those things that ha that, that come with those kinds of stories. I feel like he was a glutton for punishment stumbling through his life. And that's kind of what this movie and probably this book was. And I wondered why it's important. 
is its integrity and honesty because it holds true to his real life or to the book or whatever? I don't know. It just seemed kind of meandering as most lives are, unless you can channel it and focus it in a way that makes it movie worthy. We, we can butts. tell that he's probably going to go to Manhattan and never contact Sydney again or bother with her again. But or we don't dad. know for sure because she kind of disappeared. So perhaps the most dissatisfying thing thing for me is that I don't have confidence that JR is going to go off to Manhattan and succeed. Like, I think he's going to go off to Manhattan and, you know, it's going to be a same issues, different setting kind of a thing. It didn't feel like he was kind of in any better position than he was at the very start of the movie to succeed. Yeah, that's life, man. But you know he's going to be successful at least enough to write The Tender Bar, even though I had never heard of it before it became a movie by George Clooney. I guess that's success. And so... Did the tender bar succeed for you? I think I gave the midnight sky of a grudging all right. And this movie didn't bug me. I'm glad I got to see some parts of it. But for some other parts, I questioned its choices. I don't feel the need to hate on this one. It's an all right movie, but it truly is just kind of all right. That's all right. I'm patting George Clooney on the butt again. Again. You go, George Clooney. But I like him and I like Ben Affleck. And I guess I like this weird looking nine year old kid. And I kind of like Ty Sheridan now. In his weird-looking, older Ty Sheridan counterpart. <laughs> this is kind of in the way back category for me. Maybe like the way back. If The Tender Bar was the first dramatic movie I had seen, I'd think, wow, this is really good. But in terms of the broader scope of dramatic movies and the oeuvre of our filmmakers, Ben Affleck and George Clooney, I feel like it's kind of only okay. But for my rating purposes, I will give The Tender Bar a good. That is our discussion on The Tender Bar. You got an all right from Wes, a good from Iris. Let us know what you think about this film available on Prime Video. 818-835-0473 is our phone number or whatever movies at gmail.com is our email address. Subscribe to our podcast and follow us on social media. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next time.